And good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. I'm Bob Spiato, and very excited to be here once again. And it's time to go from Brooklyn to Broadway. And I know many of you out there are probably from Brooklyn. So come on, raise your hands. Let's see how proud you are. Let's give a loud Brooklyn cheer, loud enough so that I can hear you. Ah, that's good. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll check back in later, and we'll see how many of you still admit that you're from Brooklyn. Well, chances are it's uh, been a short trip for some, uh, perhaps a bit longer for others. Now, many of the individuals that we will talk about today are no longer with us, and several actually are still working today. But they all continue to make their presence known, and they've all made a very lasting impression. So, let's take a look inside the careers of some of Broadway's most memorable and beloved actors, playwrights and composers who began on the streets of Brooklyn and made it to the Great White Way, Broadway. And all I can say is, yous are all gonna love this. Now, we begin our Brooklyn to Broadway journey with a funny little man whose career spans more than 50 years and certainly shows no sign of slowing. The kid from Midwood. Yes, Midwood, Brooklyn, and he was named Alan Stewart Konigsberg. He was born on December 1st, 1935, but he changed his name to Haywood Allen. And at the age of 17, not long after that, he became Woody Allen. He worked as a comedy writer in the 1950s, writing jokes and scripts for television and publishing several books of short humor pieces. In the early 1960s, Allen began performing as a stand-up comedian, emphasizing monologues rather than traditional jokes. As a comedian, he developed the persona of an insecure, intellectual, fretful nebbish, which he maintains is quite different from his real-life personality. In 2004, Comedy Central ranked Woody Allen in fourth place on a list of the 100 greatest stand-up comedians. By the mid-1960s, Woody Allen was writing and directing films with more than 40 films to his credit, including Annie Hall, Manhattan, Hannah and Her Sisters, and Midnight in Paris, to name just a few. He's been nominated 24 times and has won four Academy Awards. Now, while best known for his films, Allen has enjoyed a successful career in the theater, starting as early as 1960 when he wrote sketches for the review from A to Z. His first great success was Don't Drink the Water, which opened in 1968 and ran for 498 performances for almost two years on Broadway. His success continued with Play It Again, Sam, which opened in 1969, starring Woody Allen and Diane Keaton. That show played for 453 performances and was nominated for three Tony Awards. In the 1970s, Allen wrote a number of one-act plays, most notably one entitled God and Death, which were published in his 1975 collection Without Feathers. In 1981, his play The Floating Light Bulb premiered on Broadway and ran for 65 performances. While receiving mixed reviews, it was notable for giving an autobiographical insight into Allen's childhood, specifically his fascination with magic tricks. He's written several one-act plays, including Riverside Drive and Old Saybrook, exploring well-known Woody Allen themes. After a long hiatus from the stage, Allen returned to the theater in 1995 with the one-act Central Park West, an installment in an evening of theater known as Death Defying Acts. And then in 2003, again he returned to the stage with a piece called Writer's Block, which was an evening of two one acts, Old Saybrook and Riverside Drive. And that played off-Broadway. 
The production marked the stage directing debut for Woody Allen, and the production sold out for the entire run. In 2004, Allen's first full-length play since 1981, A Secondhand Memory, was directed by Woody Allen and enjoyed an extended run off-Broadway. And then, in October 2011, Woody Allen's one-act play, Honeymoon Motel, premiered as one in a series of one-act plays on Broadway entitled Relatively Speaking. And, of course, as probably many of you know, more recently, Woody Allen adapted Bullets Over Broadway into a Broadway musical. It opened and it ran for a decent run, but it opened on April 10th, 2014, and closed on August 24th, 2014, running for 156 performances. Again, the unforgettable boy from Brooklyn, Woody Allen. Our next Brooklynite was born Betty Joan Persky in Brooklyn on September 16, 1924. Yes, actress Lauren Bacall was known for her distinctive voice and sultry looks. She was named the 20th century's greatest actress by the American Film Institute and received an honorary Academy Award. Soon after her birth, Bacall's family moved to Brooklyn's Ocean Parkway. In addition to her many memorable film roles, she appeared on Broadway in a piece called Johnny 2x4 in 1942. She also starred on Broadway in Goodbye Charlie in 1959 and went on to have a successful onstage career in the show Cactus Flower in 1965 the musical Applause in 1970, and Woman of the Year in 1981. She won Tony Awards for her performances in Applause and Woman of the Year. Now, as I'm sure many of you may recall, Applause was actually a musical version of the film All About Eve, in which Betty Davis had starred as stage diva Margot Channing. Well, Lauren Bacall returned to Broadway, starring in the original play, Waiting in the Wings, in 2000. Lauren Bacall died on August 12, 2014, at her longtime home in the Dakota, the Upper West Side apartment building overlooking Central Park in Manhattan. She was 89 and passed away only five weeks short of her 90th birthday. Another Brooklynite who you just may be somewhat familiar with, a Mr. Melvin James Kaminsky, better known to most of us by the one and only Mel Brooks, was born in Brooklyn on June 28, 1926. Brooks was a small, sickly boy who often was bullied and picked on by his classmates. Growing up in Williamsburg, he was actually taught by the great percussionist and drummer Buddy Rich how to play the drums, and he started earning money at it when he was 14. After attending Abraham Lincoln High School for a year, Brooks graduated from Eastern District High School and then spent a year at Brooklyn College as a psychology major before being drafted into the Army. He was married to actress Anne Bancroft from 1964 until her death in 2005. Now, of course, Mel Brooks is probably best known as the creator of film farces and comic parodies. He began his career as a comic and a writer for the TV variety show, Your Show of Shows. He became well known as part of the comedy duo with Carl Reiner, the 2,000-year-old man. In middle age, he became one of the most successful film directors of the 1970s, with many of his films being among the top 10 moneymakers of the year that were then released. His best-known films, of course, include The Producers, The Twelve Chairs, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, Silent Movie, High Anxiety, History of the World, Part One, Spaceballs, and Robin Hood, Men in Tights. One of his most recent successes, of course, has been the transference of his film The Producers to the Broadway stage. The show broke the Tony record with 12 wins, a record that had previously been held for 37 years by Hello, Dolly! with 10 wins. Well, the producers opened on Broadway on April 19, 2001, starring Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick, and ran for 2,502 performances. Such 
Success translated to a big screen version of the Broadway adaptation remake with actors Matthew Broderick and Nathan Lane reprising their stage roles in 2005. And then in early April 2006, Brooks began composing the score to a Broadway musical adaptation of Young Frankenstein, which he says is perhaps the best movie he ever made. The world premiere was performed at Seattle's Paramount Theater before opening on Broadway in October 2007, running for 484 performances before closing in August 2009. But he is probably going to be most remembered for that amazing production of The Producers, which continues to be produced today. Brooks joked about the concept of a musical adaptation of Blazing Saddles in his final number of Young Frankenstein, in which the full company sings, next year, Blazing Saddles. So stay tuned. Born Edward Israel Itzkowitz in January 1892, Eddie Cantor, was a performer, comedian, dancer, singer, actor, and songwriter. Familiar to a Broadway, radio, and movie, as well as early television audiences, this Apostle of Pep was regarded almost as a family member by millions because his top-rated radio shows revealed intimate stories and amusing anecdotes about his wife Ida and their five daughters. Of course, some of his memorable musical hits included Makin' Whoopi, Ida, if you knew Susie, Ma, he's making eyes at me, Margie, and how you're going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris. He also wrote a few songs, including Merrily We Roll Along and the Merry Melodies Warner Brothers cartoon theme. His eye-rolling song and dance routines eventually led to his nickname, Banjo Eyes. In 1933, the artist Frederick J. Garner caricatured Cantor with large, round eyes resembling the drum-like pot of a banjo. Of course, Eddie Cantor's charity and humanitarian work was extensive, and he is credited with coining the phrase and helping to develop the March of Dimes. Eddie Cantor made his Broadway debut in the Ziegfeld Follies of 1917, period considered the best years of the long-running review. For several years, Cantor co-starred in an act with pioneer comedian Burt Williams, both appearing in blackface. Cantor played Williams' fresh-talking son. Other co-stars with Cantor during his time in the Follies included Will Rogers, Marilyn Miller, Fanny Bryce, and W.C. Fields. Of course, Cantor moved on to stardom in book musicals, starting with Kid Boots in 1923 and Whoopi in 1928. He also appeared in the Ziegfeld Follies of 1917, 1918, 1919, 1920, 1923, and 1927, as well as the Midnight Rounders of 1920, the Broadway Brevities of 1920, Make It Snappy, Kid Boots, Eddie Cantor at the Palace, Banjo Eyes, and Nellie Bly in 1946. On, on October 10, 1964, in Beverly Hills, the enthusiastic Eddie Cantor suffered a heart attack and passed away at the age of 72. Now, Brooklyn's own Antonio Salvatore Iadanza was born on April 12, 1951. Yes, Tony Danza is known for starring on television in the series Taxi and Who's the Boss, for which he was nominated for an Emmy Award and four Golden Globe Awards. In 1998, Danza won the People's Choice Award for Favorite Male Performer in a new television series for his work on the 1997 sitcom The Tony Danza Show, not to be confused with his 2004 to 2006 daytime variety talk show of the same name. Although he considers his trademark Brooklyn accent and that his nickname was Brooklyn Tony, when Danza was 14, he and his family actually relocated to Long Island. There they settled in Malvern, where Tony Danza attended Malvern High School, graduating in 1969. 
He appeared on Broadway in the revivals of A View from the Bridge in 1998 and The Iceman Cometh in 1999. He also starred on Broadway as Max Bialystok in Mel Brooks's The Producers from 2006 to 2007. More recently, however, Tony Danza appeared in the Broadway adaptation of the 1992 film Honeymoon in Vegas. The show opened in January of this year and recently closed on April 5th. <coughs> Harvey Firestein was born to Eastern European Jewish immigrants in Brooklyn on June 6th. 1954. He was the son of Jacqueline Harriet, a school librarian, and Irving Firestein, a handkerchief manufacturer. Now, Harvey was raised in a conservative Jewish tradition, but he states that he is non-observant and considers himself an atheist. His trademark gruff but somewhat soft voice brought him much attention as did the fact that he was openly gay at a time when very few celebrities were. And his career as both a stand-up comic and a female impersonator are mostly, mostly behind him. Currently, he resides in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Now, Feinstein has won the Tony Award for Best Actor for his own play, Torch Song Trilogy, about a gay drag performer and his quest for true love and family. And he also won the Tony Award for Best Actor in a Musical for playing Edna Turnblad in Hairspray. He also wrote the book for the musical La Cage aux Faux, for which he won the Tony Award for Best Book of a Musical. Also, Legs Diamond, his 1988 collaboration with Peter Allen, was a critical and commercial failure closing after 72 previews and 64 performances. His other playwriting credits include Safe Sex, Spook House, and Forget Him. On Broadway, he also replaced Alfred Molina as Tevye in the 2004 revival of Fiddler on the Roof. In 2007, Harvey wrote the book to the musical A Catered Affair, in which he also starred. After tryouts at San Diego's Old Globe Theater in September 2007, it opened on Broadway in April 2008 and closed in July of that year. Now, Feierstein returned to the theater when he reprised the role of Tevye, replacing an injured Topol in the national tour of Fiddler on the Roof starting in December 2009. In February 2011, he replaced Douglas Hodge as Alban Zaza in the Broadway revival of La Cage aux Faux. He also wrote the book for the stage musical Newsies, along with Alan Menken and Jack Feldman. The musical opened on Broadway in March 2012 and closed in August 2014. His most recent play, Casa Valentina, produced on Broadway by Manhattan Theatre Club, opened on Broadway April 2014 and closed in June of that year and actually starred proud Hofstra alumnus Tom McGowan. Feierstein also wrote the book for a stage musical version of the film Kinky Boots with music and lyrics by Cyndi Lauper. It opened on Broadway in June 2013 and is still kicking up its heels. The musical was nominated for 13 2013 Tony Awards and won six, including Best Musical. He was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame in 2007. Now, one of the most significant American composers of the 20th century, known for popular stage and screen numbers as well as classical compositions, George Gershwin was born on September 26, 1898 in Brooklyn. He dropped out of school and began playing piano professionally at the age of 15. Within a few years, he was one of the most sought after musicians in America, a composer of jazz, opera, and popular songs for the stage and screen. Many of his works are, of course, now standards. The mere mention of his name brings to musical minds such classics as They Can't Take That Away From Me, Embraceable You, Someone to Watch Over Me, the music from Porgy and Bess, and of course, Rhapsody in Blue, to name just a few. 
His compositions have been represented on Broadway from the 1920s until today, beginning with George White's Scandals in 1920 through 1924, Lady Be Good, Tiptoes, Tell Me More, OK, Strike Up the Band, Funny Face, Rosalie, Showgirl, Girl Crazy, Of Thee I Sing, Pardon My English, Let Em Eat Cake, My One and Only, which actually opened on Broadway in 1983, which was an original musical using previously written Gershwin songs. And many of you may remember the Broadway production of Crazy For You in 1992, which was actually a revised version of Gershwin's earlier Broadway show, Girl Crazy. And of course, the more recent Broadway hit in 2012, Nice Work If You Can Get It, a musical with a score by both George and Ira Gershwin. Doctors would eventually discover that Gershwin had developed a malignant brain tumor. On July 11, 1937, Gershwin died during surgery to remove the tumor. He was only 38 years old. But his music lives on, and he is currently represented on Broadway with the new production of An American in Paris, which just opened on April 12th. The highly acclaimed production just received 12 Tony Award nominations, including Best Musical. Jack Guilford was born in Brooklyn as Yankel Gelman. He began his career in the amateur nights of the 1930s, moving on to nightclubs as an innovative comedian doing satire and pantomime. He was a regular at the Greenwich Village night spot Cafe Society and hosted shows featuring Zero Mostel and Billy Holiday. He is credited as having invented the expression, the butler did it, as part of one of his satire routines. He also did a facial pantomime of something called pea soup coming to a boil. During the 1950s, he was a victim of the House Un-American Activities Committee blacklisting, which stalled his TV career until the early 1960s. But after that, he became a regular, popular comic character actor on dozens of TV series and movies. He was most recognized for being the rubber-faced guy on the Cracker Jacks commercials for a dozen years, from 1960 to 1972. He was also nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for the film Save the Tiger in 1973, starring opposite Jack Lemmon, who won the Best Actor Oscar for his performance. But it was actually on Broadway that Jack Guilford found his greatest fame. He starred in Meet the People, a musical review from 1940 to 1941. And again, in the production, They Should Have Stood in Bed in 1942. He appeared in the 1950 musical review, Alive and Kicking, and again on, in the play on Broadway in 1950 called The Live Wire. And was notably recognized for his performance in 1955 through 1957 for his appearance in the play The Diary of Anne Frank. He also appeared on Broadway in Romanoff and Juliet, Drink to Me Only, Look After Lulu, and Once Upon a Mattress, the wonderful musical in 1959. Guilford initially played the role of King Sextimus off-Broadway, but when Once Upon a Mattress moved to Broadway, the role was played by Will Lee instead. Guilford, though, reprised his Sextimus performance for two television productions of the musical. He also appeared on Broadway in the play The Tenth Man, on Broadway in the musical, the fun A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and of course, Cabaret, and also Three Men on a Horse. He also appeared in No, No, Nanette, that wonderful Broadway musical revival in 1971, and also in Neil Simon's The Sunshine Boys, replacing Jack Albertson. His final Broadway performances were Sly Fox, the supporting cast, and the world of Sholom Aleichem in 1982. On Broadway, he was actually nominated for Tony Awards for Best Supporting Actor in the musical A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum and in Cabaret. 
The song Miskite was actually written for him by John Kander and Fred Ebb. And Jack Guilford performed that memorable song on Broadway to great acclaim. Following a year-long battle with stomach cancer, Jack Guilford passed away in his Greenwich Village home in 1990 at the age of 82. His wife, Madeline Lee Guilford, died on April 15, 2008 from undisclosed causes. Guilford is buried in the Yiddish theater section of Flushing, New York's Mount Hebron Cemetery. Now, speaking of his early years in Seagate, Brooklyn, Moss Hart was destined to make his mark on Broadway after working several years as a director of amateur theatrical groups and as an entertainment director at summer resorts, he scored his first Broadway hit with the play Once in a Lifetime in 1930, a farce about the arrival of the second era in Hollywood. The play was written in collaboration with Broadway veteran George S. Kaufman, who regularly wrote with others, notably Mark Connolly and Edna Ferber. Kaufman also performed in the play's original Broadway cast in the role of a frustrated playwright hired by Hollywood. During the next decade, Kaufman and Hart teamed on a string of successes, including You Can't Take It With You in 1936 and The Man Who Came to Dinner in 1939. Though Kaufman had hits with others, Hart is generally considered to be his most important collaborator. Now, You Can't Take It With You is a story that probably many of you are probably familiar with. And it, of course, took place during the Depression. Well, You Can't Take It With You is the story of a somewhat eccentric family. And it won the 1937 Pulitzer Prize for Drama. It is Hart's most revived play. And when it was adapted for the screen in 1938, the film won the Best Picture Oscar. The Man Who Came to Dinner is about the caustic Sheridan Whiteside who, after injuring himself slipping on ice, must stay in a Midwestern family's house. The character was actually based on Kaufman and Hart's friend, critic Alexander Wolcott. Other characters in the play are based on Noel Coward, Harpo Marx, and Gertrude Lawrence. After the play George Washington Slept Here, Kaufman and Hart called it quits. And although throughout the 1930s Hart worked with both on and off, with and without Kaufman on several musical reviews, including Face the Music, As Thousands Cheer, with songs by Irving Berlin, Jubilee, a musical in 1939 with songs by Cole Porter, and I'd Rather Be Right in 1937 with songs by Richard Rodgers and Lawrence Hart. Hart continued to write plays after parting with Kaufman, such as Christopher Blake and Light Up the Sky, as well as the book for the musical Lady in the Dark, which starred the wonderful kid from Brooklyn, Danny Kaye. It also included songs by Kurt Weill and Ira Gershwin. However, Moss Hart became best known during this period as a Broadway director. Among the Broadway hits he staged were Junior Miss in 1941, Dear Ruth in 1944, and Anniversary Waltz in 1954. By far, his biggest hit was the musical My Fair Lady, in 1956, adapted from George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, with book and lyrics by Alan J. Lerner and music by Frederick Lowe. The show ran for over seven years and won a Tony Award for Best Musical. Oh, and by the way, Moss Hart picked up a Tony for Best Director. He also wrote several screenplays, including Gentleman's Agreement, for which he received an Oscar nomination, Hans Christian Andersen, and A Star is Born. He wrote a memoir entitled Act One, an autobiography by Moss Hart, which was released in 1959. It was adapted to a film in 1963 with George Hamilton portraying Hart. And recently, this show was actually produced as a stage version, playing at Lincoln Center's Vivian Beaumont Theater. The last show Hart directed was the Lerner and Lowe musical Camelot in 1960. During a troubled out-of-town tryout, Hart suffered a heart attack. The show opened before he fully recovered, but he and Lerner reworked it after the opening. That, along with huge pre-sales and a cast performance on The Ed Sullivan Show, helped ensure the expensive production was a hit. In 1972, approximately 11 years after his death, Moss Hart was posthumously inducted into the American Theatre Hall of Fame. 
He was one of 23 people to be selected into the Hall of Fame's first ever induction class that year. Now, born in Brooklyn on April 29th, 1917, Celeste Holm was an only child, born into a home where her mother was a painter and her father worked in the insurance field. She studied acting at the University of Chicago and made her stage debut in 1936. Holmes' first professional theatrical role was in a production of Hamlet, starring Leslie Howard. She first appeared on Broadway in a small part in a piece called Gloriana in 1938, a comedy which lasted for only five performances. But her first major part on Broadway was in William Saroyan's revival of The Time of Your Life in 1940, appearing as Mary L., along with fellow newcomer Gene Kelly. The role that got her the most recognition from critics and audiences, however, was the role of Edo Annie in the premiere production of Roger and Hammers, Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma in 1943. And it was there that she first sang the song, I Can't Say No. She appeared in many successful plays after on Broadway, including The Women, Bloomer Girl, Affairs of State, Invitation to a March, the musical Mame, King and I, and I Hate Hamlet, to name just a few. She was signed by 20th Century Fox in 1946 and appeared in several memorable films, including Three Little Girls in Blue, and with her third film, Gentleman's Agreement, in 1947, this was followed up by performances in All About Eve, The Tender Trap, and of course, the wonderful musical film High Society in 1956. Following a career that spanned more than 60 years, Celeste Holm passed away at the age of 95 on July 15th, 2012. The next Brooklynite, I have to say, quite honestly, is uh, very special to me. And for the last several years, I've been paying musical tribute to him in my own one-man show, aptly entitled Courting the Jester. Well, this Kid from Brooklyn was born David Daniel Kaminsky on January 18th, 1911, on East Bradford Street in Brooklyn. And although he starred in 17 films, appeared on television and radio, delighting audiences worldwide, the one and only Danny Kay loved being on stage. He once remarked how nothing was like the thrill of performing before a live audience. And if you saw him live, it was truly an experience that you would never forget. He attended good old PS149 and Thomas Jefferson High School and was always acting up and acting out in school. His debut on The Great White Way was in the Straw Hat Review along with Sylvia Fine, who served as pianist, lyricist, and composer. Of course, Sylvia would eventually become his wife. The Straw Hat Review opened in September 1939 and closed after 10 weeks but critics took notice of Danny Kaye's unique work. The reviews brought an offer for both Kaye and his bride, Sylvia, to work at La Martinique, a New York City nightclub. Kaye performed with Sylvia as a, his accompanist. Well, it turns out that Brooklyn's own Moss Hart saw Danny perform, which led to Moss Hart casting him in his hit Broadway comedy, The Musical Lady in the Dark. Well, Kay scored a triumph at the age of 30 in 1941, playing Russell Paxton in Lady in the Dark, starring Gertrude Lawrence. His show-stopping number was entitled Tchaikovsky by Kurt Weill and Ira Gershwin, in which he sang the names of a string of Russian composers at breakneck speed, seemingly without taking a breath. Let's see if right now, for you, I can do the same thing.
There's Malachevsky, Rubinstein, Arensky, and Tchaikovsky, Sapelnikov, Dmitriev, Cherepkin, Krijanovsky, Godovsky, Artebuchev, Moniuska, Wakimenko, Solofiev, Prokofiev, Tiomkin, Koryshchenko. There's Glinka, Winkler, Bortinyansky, Rebekov, Ilyinsky. There's Mertra, Balakirov, Zolotorov, and Koshinsky, and Sokolov, and Kopolov, Dukelsky, and Klenovsky, and Shostakovich, Borodin, Glier, and Novakovsky. There's Lyadov, Karganov, Markeyevich, Panchenko, and Dargamiski, Cherbechevsky, Skravian, Vasilenko. Stravinsky, Vimsky, Korsakov, Mizorsky, and Grachaninov, Glazinov, and Cesar Kui, Kalinikov, Rachmaninov, Stravinsky, and Grachaninov, Rushinsky, and Rachmaninov. I really have to stop because you all have undergone enough. Stravinsky, Rachmaninov, Rushinsky, Rachmaninov. I really have to stop because you all have undergone enough. I think I did the best I could. Well, in the next Broadway season, Danny Kaye was the star of a show about a young man who was drafted. And the show was entitled Let's Face It, and he received outstanding reviews. Not bad for a guy who couldn't read music, but for a guy who loved baseball, was a great chef and an accomplished pilot, and he was the first worldwide ambassador for UNICEF. Still feeling that he had more to accomplish, in 1970, he returned to the live stage in Richard Rodgers' final Broadway musical, Two by Two in which Danny portrayed Noah, as in Noah and the Ark. Reviews were mixed, but Danny stole the show. Interestingly enough, Danny could have appeared on Broadway in at least three other shows, but he turned down the parts that he was offered. Why? Because they were too Jewish. Had he accepted, we might have actually seen Danny Kaye on Broadway as Nathan Detroit in Guys and Dolls, and as Fagin in the musical Oliver, and Danny Kay was the original choice for the role of Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof, but he turned that part down as well. That role was given to another Brooklynite, who I'll talk about next. Danny Kay passed peacefully away on March 7th, 1987, but he left the legacy of music and laughter and musical memories that we can all still enjoy. Well, Samuel Joel Zero Mostel was born in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn on February 28, 1915, and is remembered for his stage and screen roles, but probably best known for his creation and portrayal of Broadway characters such as Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof, and Pseudalus on stage, and on screen in A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and of course, Max Bialystok in the original film version of The Producers. He was blacklisted during the 1950s, and his testimony before the House Committee on Un-American Activities was well publicized. He was an Obie Award and three-time Tony Award winner. One story has it that the name Zero was actually created by a press agent when Mustel began his career as a nightclub comic. The name was created at the behest of Barney Josephson, proprietor of the Cafe Society nightclub, who felt that the name Sam Mustel was just not appropriate for a comic. However, according to Zero's brother, Bill Mostel, their mother coined the nickname Zero, noting that if he continued to do poorly at school, he would amount to a zero. In 1942 alone, his salary at the Cafe Society went up from $40 a week to $450 a week. He appeared on radio shows, opened in two Broadway shows, played at the Paramount Theater, appeared in an MGM movie, and was booked at La Martinique at $4,000 a week. He also made cameo appearances at the Yiddish Theater, the style of which influenced his own. In 1943, Life magazine described him as just about the funniest American now living. On the 13th of January, 1960, while exiting a taxi on his way back from rehearsals for the play The Good Soup, Mustel was hit by a number 18, now the M86. That was the 86th Street Crosstown bus, and his leg was totally crushed. The doctors wanted to amputate the leg, which would have effectively ended his stage career. But Zero Mustel refused. Accepting the risk of gangrene, he remained hospitalized for four months. Well, the gamble paid off, but the injury took a toll regardless for the rest of his life and the massively scarred leg gave him pain and required frequent rests and baths. After, uh, after incurring his injury, he retained the famous Harry Lipsig, self-described king of torts as his attorney. 
The case was settled for an undisclosed sum. But from this time forward, Zero Mostel would carry a cane wherever he went, and especially whenever he famously attended the Metropolitan Opera. And of course, this went along with that wonderful cape that he also loved to wear. Other Broadway appearances included Keep Em Laughing, Beggar's Holiday, and his acclaimed performance in Ionesco's absurdist play, Rhinoceros. In the last four months of his life, Zero Mostel took on a nutritionally unsound diet, later described by his friends as a starvation diet, that reduced his weight from 304 pounds to 215 pounds. During rehearsals for Arnold Wesker's new play, The Merchant, in which Zero Mostel played a reimagined version of Shakespeare's Shylock in Philadelphia, he collapsed in his dressing room and was taken to the hospital. He was diagnosed with a respiratory disorder, and it was believed he was in no danger and would be released soon. However, on September 8, 1977, Mostel complained of dizziness and lost consciousness. The attending physicians were unable to revive him, and he was pronounced dead that evening. It is believed that he suffered an aortic aneurysm. Wesker actually wrote a book chronicling the out-of-town tribulations that beset the play and culminated in Zero Mostel's death. And the book was aptly titled, The Birth of Shylock and the Death of Zero Mostel. Here's a, a little quote. I remember when I was five years old, living on Pulaski Street in Brooklyn. The hallway of our building had a brass banister and a great sound, a great echo system. I used to sing in the hallway. Well, those are the famous words of that famous funny girl, Barbara, that's B-A-R-B-R-A, -R -R Streisand. Born Barbara Jones Streisand on April 24, 1942. During a career spanning six decades, she's become an icon in multiple fields of entertainment. She's been recognized with two Academy Awards, eight Grammy Awards, five Emmy Awards, including one Daytime Emmy, a Special Tony Award, an American Film Institute Award, a Kennedy Center Honor Prize. Oh, and the list just goes on and on and on. And she is among a select group of entertainers who have been honored with all the major industry prizes. Streisand is one of the best-selling music artists of all time, with more than 75 million albums in the United States and with a total of 245 million records sold worldwide, making her the best-selling female artist among the top-selling artists recognized by the Recording Industry Association of America. After beginning a successful recording career in the 60s, Streisand ventured into film, starring in the critically acclaimed Funny Girl, for which she won the Academy Award and the Golden Globe Award for Best Actress. Her other films included The Owl and the Pussycat, The Way We Were, and A Star is Born, for which she received her second Academy Award, composing music for the love theme Evergreen. With the release of Yentl in 1983, Streisand established herself as one of the film industry's most notable figures by becoming the first woman to write, produce, direct, and star in a major film. That film won an Oscar for Best Score and Best Motion Picture Musical. Streisand received the Golden Globe Award for Best Director, the first and only to date of a woman to win that award. Now, Streisand began her education at the Jewish Orthodox Yeshiva of Brooklyn when she was five years old. There, she was considered to be bright and extremely curious about everything, but she lacked discipline, often shouting answers to questions out of turn. She next entered Public School 89 in Brooklyn, and during those early school years, she began watching television and, of course, was going to the movies. Watching the glamorous stars on the screen, she was soon entranced by acting and had hoped that someday she would become an actress, partly as a means of escape. Quote, I always wanted to be a somebody, to be famous, you know, get out of Brooklyn, close quote. Streisand became known by others in the neighborhood for having a good voice. With the other kids, she remembers sitting on the stoop in front of her Brooklyn flat and singing, quote, I was considered the girl on the block with the good voice, close quote. That talent became a way for her to gain attention. She made her singing debut, somewhat professionally, at a PTA assembly, where she became a hit to everyone but her mother, who was mostly critical of her daughter. 
Young Streisand was invited to sing at weddings and summer camp, along with having an unsuccessful audition at MGM Records when she was nine. But by the time she was 13, her mother began supporting her talent, helping her make a four-song demo tape, including the song Zing, Went the Strings of My Heart, and an incredible rendition of the song You'll Never Know, a song composed by Brooklyn's own Harry Warren. Streisand attended Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn in 1955, where she became an honor student in modern history, English, and Spanish. She also joined the freshman chorus and choral club, where she sang along with another choir member and a classmate by the name of Neil Diamond. Diamond recalls, we were two poor kids in Brooklyn. We hung out in front of Erasmus High and smoked cigarettes. Well, she was singing in various New York City clubs, and while appearing at the Blue Angel, a theater director and playwright by the name of Arthur Lawrence asked her to audition for a new musical comedy that he was directing called I Can Get It For You Wholesale. Well, she got the part of the secretary and, well, that led to her playing opposite businessman and friend Elliot Gould. They fell in love during rehearsals and eventually moved into a small apartment together above a seafood restaurant on 3rd Avenue. The Broadway show, I Can Get It For You Wholesale, opened in 1962 and received rave reviews. Her performance stopped the show cold, and she became Broadway's most exciting and youngest new star. Streisand received a Tony nomination and a New York Drama Critics Prize for Best Supporting Actress. The show was recorded, and it was the first time that the public could purchase an album of Barbara Streisand's singing. She returned to Broadway in 1964 with an acclaimed performance as entertainer Fanny Bryce in Funny Girl at the Winter Garden Theater. The show, of course, introduced, introduced two of her signature songs, People and Don't Rain on My Parade. Because of the play's overnight success, she appeared on the cover of Time. In 1964, Streisand was nominated for a Tony Award for Best Actress in a Musical, but lost to Carol Channing in Hello, Dolly. Streisand received an Honorary Star of the Decade Tony Award in 1970. Almost 40 albums later, and following several concert tours, films, and TV appearances, not to mention many awards and honors, on October 11th, 2012, Streisand gave a three-hour concert performance before a crowd of almost 18,000 people as part of the ongoing inaugural events of the Barclays Center in her native Brooklyn, her first ever public performance in her own hometown, to which we say, Brava, Barbara. Now, Eli Wallach was born Eli Herschel Wallach on December 7, 1915 at 156 Union Street in Red Hook. For more than six decades, he's appeared in film, on television, and on stage. He trained in stage acting, which he enjoyed doing most. And he became one of the greatest character actors ever to appear on stage and screen. With over 90 film credits and just as many performances on stage, if not more. On stage, he often co-starred with his wife, Anne Jackson, becoming one of the best-known acting couples in the American theater. Wallach initially studied method acting under Sandy Meisner, and later became a founding member of the famous Actors Studio, where he studied under Lee Strasberg. His versatility gave him the ability to play a wide variety of different roles throughout his career, primarily as a supporting actor. In 1945, Wallach made his Broadway debut, and he won a Tony Award in 1951 for his performance alongside Maureen Stapleton in the Tennessee Williams play, The Rose Tattoo. His other theater credits included Mr. Roberts, The Tea House of the August Moon, Camino Real, Major Barbara, in which director Charles Lawton discouraged Wallach's established method acting style, Love, and Staircase, co-starring Milo O'Shea, with, which is a serious depiction of an aging homosexual couple. He also played in a tour of Antony and Cleopatra, produced by actress Catherine Cornell in 1946. And he exposed Americans to the work of playwright Eugene Ionesco in plays like The Chairs, The Lesson, and of course in the 1961 play Rhinoceros, where he starred opposite Zero Mostel, as you can see here. He last starred on stage as the title character in Visiting Mr. Green. 
The stage was where Wallach focused his early career. From 1945 to 1950, he and his wife Ann Jackson worked together acting in various plays by Tennessee Williams. Interestingly enough, when he did get offered early movie parts, he turned them down with no regrets. And he very early in his career explained his reasoning. Quote, what do I need a movie for? The stage is on a higher level in every way and a more satisfying medium. Movies, by comparison, are like calendar art next to great paintings. You can't really do very much in movies or in television. But the stage is such, an, such a fabulous medium. Acting is the most alive thing I can do and the most joyous. Well, despite the fact that he eventually acted in over 90 films and almost as many television dramas, he continued to accept stage parts throughout his career. He and Jackson together played in comedies like The Typists and the Tiger, Waltz of the Toreadors, The Diary of Anne Frank, and Nest of the Woodgrouse. They continued acting together as late as 2000, while he also took on roles alone throughout all those years. Eli Wallach died on June 24, 2014, of natural causes at the age of 98. That's Amore. Chattanooga Choo Choo, 42nd Street, I only have eyes for you. At last, you're getting to be a habit with me. September in the rain. I found a million dollar baby in a five and 10 cent store. You'll never know the more I see you. Nagasaki, I got a gal in K-A-L-A-M-A-Z-O-O. -O. Serenade in Blue and, very appropriately, Lullaby of Broadway are just a few of the memorable songs composed by Brooklyn-born Salvatore Guaragna. Born in December 1893, who was eventually registered in school as Harry Warren. Warren was the first major American songwriter to write primarily for film. He was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Song 11 times and won three Oscars for composing Lullaby of Broadway, You'll Never Know, and On the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. He wrote the music for the first blockbuster film musical, 42nd Street, choreographed by Busby Berkeley. Over a career spanning four decades, Harry Warren wrote more than a thousand songs and was one of America's most prolific film composers. And his songs have been featured in over 400 films. He collaborated on some of these songs with some of the most famous lyricists to date. Al Dubin, Billy Rose, Mac Gordon, Lee, Leo Robin, Ira Gershwin, and Johnny Mercer. In 1942, the Gordon Warren song, Chattanooga Choo Choo, as performed by the Glenn Miller Orchestra, became the first gold record in history. In 1980, producer David Merrick and director Gower Champion adapted the 1933 film 42nd Street into the blockbuster smash Broadway musical that won the Tony Award for Best Musical in 1981, which ran on Broadway for 3,486 performances, and since then has had several major revivals, most notably from 2001 to 2005. Harry Warren, who once stated that he liked writing music and if people liked it, it had to be because it came from his heart. Well, Harry Warren died in September 1981, and a small theater in Brooklyn is named after him. And so we come to the end of our Brooklyn to Broadway journey with a female playwright by the name of Wendy Wasserstein, who was born in Brooklyn in October 1950 and passed away in January 2006. She received the Tony Award for Best Play and the Pulitzer Prize for Drama in 1989 for her play, The Heidi Chronicles, which was recently revived on Broadway and closed just this past weekend. Wasserstein's first production of note was Uncommon Women and Others. The play was workshopped at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center in 1977, and a full version of the play was produced in 1977 off-Broadway with Glenn Close and Susie Kurtz playing the lead roles. The play was subsequently produced for PBS with Meryl Streep replacing Close. While at Yale, she also co-wrote a musical with fellow student Christopher Durang entitled When Dinah Shore Ruled the Earth. In 1989, she won the Tony Award, the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize, and the Pulitzer Prize for Drama for her play, The Heidi Chronicles. Additional plays, which graced the Broadway stage, exploring topics ranging from feminism to family to ethnicity to pop culture, included Broadway productions of The Sisters Rosenzweig, Isn't It Romantic?, An American Daughter, Old Money, and her last work, which opened in 2005 on Broadway, 
simply called Third. During her career, which spanned nearly four decades, Wasserstein wrote 11 plays, winning a Tony Award, a Pulitzer Prize, a New York Drama Critics Circle Award, a Drama Desk Award, and an Outer Critics Circle Award. Wasserstein was hospitalized with lymphoma in December 2005 and died on January 30th, 2006 at the age of 55. The news of her death was unexpected because her illness had not been widely publicized outside the theater community. The night after she died, Broadway's lights were dimmed in her honor. So there you have it. A very unique collection of Brooklyn characters. We started with a Woody and we ended with a Wendy, all from Brooklyn. Oh, and also, in 2004, there was actually something called Brooklyn the Musical. And I'm sure several of you out there have also been born and bred in Brooklyn. Now raise your hands again if you're from Brooklyn. Shout it out. Because I'd even venture to say that in every audience out there this morning, there are at least two or three in each group that hail from Brooklyn. Maybe more. And although you may not have made it on Broadway, I'll bet you've seen a show on Broadway. All of the talented individuals we've touched upon today have certainly touched all our lives in some special and memorable way. And at some point, they crossed that famous bridge and they made it on Broadway. Well, thanks all so very much, and may all your days be Brooklyn days.